coffee and water. Oh, I see some people have brought their own to port. It's delicious. Their coffee is equally good here. Uh, how's, how's everybody doing this morning? Are, are we pumped to be at such a mini breakfast? Are we excited to be at Melrose first thing in the morning? How many people? Uh, how many people are planning on visiting Melrose this weekend? How many people are planning on not leaving social media breakfast and continuing their day at Melrose? Yes. Uh, got a little bit of a situation here where I've got to uh, push some buttons and do some things. So we got some music going on, Miss Haley. Is there any way we can turn that down? I'll take that as a yes, eventually. Uh, so, uh, welcome to Social Media Breakfast. Uh, who is, who's been here before? Alright. And I see some ING Direct scarves out here. Who, uh, who hasn't been here before? Oh, wow. Wow. That's cool. Um, well, Social Media Breakfast, uh, does, does somebody want to talk about what Social Media Breakfast is? Who's been here before? Does somebody want to do my part in the intro of Social Media Breakfast? No? <laughs> Social Media Breakfast is a place where uh, all kind of people in Calgary who are interested in digital media and social media come to talk about social media. And uh, so there are people here from uh, really new people in digital media to you know, seasoned experts. We've got you know, Sean Sanders over here who's going to be a... Uh, yeah, I'm calling you out, sorry. And uh, he's going to be moderating the FP Reach uh, social media conference with Gary Vaynerchuk next uh, week sometime. And uh, we also have people, uh, we've got Jeff Kahane. Anybody know this guy, Jeff Kahane? And uh, oh, you're far more popular than the audience let on. Uh, who is a lawyer, so we've got some lawyer people here. We've got a lot of really people who are connected to the digital scene. So if you have questions about digital media, this is the place to uh, find out. Uh, to learn more, network, and meet more people in the industry. Yeah, can you? you might. Thank you. Um, Social Media Breakfast is run by uh, Chaos Consultant, which is Miss uh, Don McTaggart. Where are you? There she is, right in the back uh, So thank you. You can find Donna McTaggart on uh, Donna MCT uh, on Twitter, and Chaos Consulting helps uh, organizations implement uh, accounting. Uh, uh, software into their practice. They're really cool, and she's, she's the best of the best. Uh, thank you to our food sponsor, Volvia. Where's Miss Heather Ilsley? There she is in the corner there. So this is a really cool little company. Uh, Volvia does uh, search and optimization, social media, social media marketing, uh, pay-per-click, copywriting. Uh, they've been around for quite a while. Uh, really, really good uh, SEO. Uh, one of the best in Calgary, I'd say. So uh, thank you for feeding us today, Volvia. We are all a lot happier and pleasant because of it. Uh, thanks to Melrose for having us here. Uh, Ms. Haley over there. Big wave, Haley. So the cool thing that Haley's going to do is um, she's got these uh, five dollar gift cards or uh, coupons or uh, I'm not sure what the coupon. Yeah, gift card. That's much cooler than a coupon. Um, that she'll be giving you uh, away at the end of this breakfast. So just go see her and she'll give you five bucks here. If you want to follow um, uh, Volvia, sorry, online there. Oh, I'm out of breath up here. Volvia Marketing is our Twitter handle, and you can visit them at volvia.com. Melrose is um, Melrose Red Mile on Twitter, and uh, you can uh, visit them online as well. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ask a, a couple of questions here, and uh, um, does anybody not want to talk to me? Nobody's making eye contact. Uh, so you guys you guys are, are new here, right? Or you're new, first time? What brought you out here? Um, I'm trying to check here. Um, you might have to go on are you on Twitter? Sure. And what do you like social? Uh, you know, I'm out there. You are out there. What's your Twitter handle? Truck Norris. <laughs> wow. Truck Norris can hear sign language. So, uh, what uh, what are you hoping to get out of today? Um, a little networking uh, possibilities and. Fantastic. Anybody especially you want to network with? You? <laughs> you sure know how to sweet talk a fella. Uh, uh, anybody else? Uh, is, is anybody here have their own YouTube account? Their own business YouTube account? Hand in the air? 
one person. I don't believe that. So, what's your name? Victor. Victor, what do you do? I work for an environmental engineering company. Ooh, environmental, environmental engineering. And uh, what do you use your YouTube account for? Right now, we just use it to tell the world about what we do. We, we design, build, and do things that prevent or reduce harm to the environment. Cool, love it. And so how, uh, how has your YouTube channel been helping you do that? Um, not a whole lot of traffic on it yet, so we're looking for ways to build that. And do you have any tips on how to make good videos? Uh, yep. <laughs> More women. Hmm. I, I don't think that's totally false. But you, have, you have to make it interesting, you have to make it relevant, and you have to make it brief. Interesting, relevant, and brief. Very cool. Um, and just a random question, does anybody have a SlideShare account that they use for business? That is quite like PowerPoint. Nobody. All right. Um, SlideShare.com, real cool uh, uh, tool to... So yeah, if you keep doing that, I keep forgetting you're there. Uh, so right now we have... Uh, anybody know Gimme Up? GiveyUp is a really cool uh, uh, new platform, I would say, that's uh, coming out and uh, it's all about uh, giving up your day and dough for uh, others in need. Um, right now we have Mr. Uh, Jeff here to talk about it. Great, thanks Kevin. And thanks for the invite, Donna. And uh, Melrose, thanks for the great venue. Uh, my name is Jeff Kuller and I'm co-founder of GiveyUp.org uh, with Alex Bruton. I don't think knows that name. He's the uh, Trico Educator in Residence and a professor at Mount Royal University. And it's particularly fitting that I'm here on Black Friday because the uh, consumer frenzy is what we're trying to interrupt a little bit and redirect some of that um, frenzied spending at the holiday season for our life celebrations and redirect that to some small charities here in town that do really awesome work that you might not normally hear about. So we're running a pilot project this Christmas where you can donate some of your Christmas gifts in lieu of getting gifts. You can ask your friends and family to donate to either Calgary Reads, which is a really awesome organization right downtown here uh, that helps grade one and two students learn how to read, and the Cochrane and Area Boys and Girls Club, who are a really awesome uh, project. So we're launching in about a week, um, Structured Abstraction, Mike in the back there is helping us build the platform. And we're running it as a, as a test project to see how it works. Um, it's a social business, so it's not designed to make any money, but it's also designed to not lose money. So it's really, a, it's a test all around. So it's helping people uh, do good and feel good and have less stuff in their life. So thanks a lot. Check us out, and I'll be around to uh, chat about Thanks, Jeff. And, uh, whoa, 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 where are you going, where are you going? I don't want somebody to click my slide, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so, to thank everybody who is making this possible today, uh, such as Dr. McTaggart, uh, Bovia, and uh, 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 Melrose Red Mile, um, can we send out a tweet? Can we show some social love to these guys? And so I have taken the liberty of uh, taking out a tweet for you on the screen, and it says thank you. Uh, Avovia Marketing, Melrose Red Mile, and uh, Donna MCT for hosting and feeding us at SMB YYC. Just said I need to spit out my gun. All right, are, are, are we ready to rock? Are we moving forward? So we have lots of sponsors, lots of people who have supported social media breakfast in the past, and we're really grateful for for all those people. You know, every, everybody from um, Service Credit Union to uh, Suitcase to um, Q Design. Um, oh, other way. Uh, our ongoing sponsors are uh, Chaos Consulting, which is Donovan Taggart, uh, Genome Alberta, who is uh, helping sponsor our new social media breakfast website, which is coming up soon, uh, Market Wire, who always does our press releases, phenomenal people. Um, if you are into social media monitoring, uh, they have a phenomenal uh, product called Heartbeat. Uh, they also do killer social media press releases. Uh, Calgary Speed Dating, if you are looking for that special someone, Catherine can help you find that. Uh, Matrix does our video. And uh, my name is Kevin Haney, as I wish forget to introduce myself. Uh, KevinHaney.ca is my uh, website and my Twitter handle is KevinHaney.ca. 
uh, social or SMB committee, if you're looking to get involved with us, uh, you can talk to anybody of the committee members. We have Donna McTaggart, which is in the back. Uh, Mike Spear, are you here today? No, nope, I don't think so. Uh, Catherine, where are you? She's right at the back. Also, Calgary's connector, matchmaker, speed dater. Uh, Kevin Hayes, that's me. Uh, Dez is not here. Uh, Heather Ilsley is sitting back in the corner, and Crystal oh, is right there. So if you have any questions about Social Media Breakfast, you can talk to uh, any one of the people on the team. Uh, we're always looking for sponsors and venue and food sponsors. So venue sponsors need to hold about 100 people. It's anywhere, you usually get around 80 to 120 people at an event. Um, uh, so we need a venue, so if you have a big space you can donate to us, that'd be great. Uh, food sponsors as well, uh, usually costs about 300 or $250 to uh, feed the crew down here. If you want to get a hold of us, you can talk to one of the committee members about sponsorship, or you can tweet us at SMBYYC. And follow us on Twitter, SMBYYC. If you're going to tweet today, can you please use the hashtag SMBYYC? Should I be standing in front of the camera? Um, it's not important to get me in the picture. Um, uh, yeah. Social Media Breakfast in uh, Edmonton is SMBYEG, last Friday of every, uh, every month. So, Jeff Kahane uh, is a real interesting fellow. Uh, has been, uh, his practice does uh, a whole bunch of general law, or uh, they do all types of law, and uh, he's been practicing since 2000. And uh, so, uh, he, his, his law office has won a bazillion awards around um, best place to work, uh, a bunch of industry uh, awards, and what I find interesting about that is that on his website, you'll find all these awards that he's won. But, who cares if it's on his own website? That's what I say. So, but what's really important to me is what people are actually saying about Jeff online. And so if you do a little bit of research about uh, Kahane Law Office, you'll see that people are saying that it's always refreshing to deal with such a high level of customer service when the pressure is on. We'll not hesitate to recommend this law firm to anybody. Oh, there should be one more. Oh, there we go. And then other people are saying the Kahane Law Office is a full service law firm and the office staff is friendly and fast. We also enjoyed the Pez collection. So, which makes me wonder, Jeff, did you bring any Pez for us today? No? Okay, no problem. We can all visit your office. Uh, it helps to make a uh, good mood uh, of the office light and easy going. So people love this guy online. His, his law firm is, is amazing. Jeff's an amazing guy. Um, I don't need to gush about him anymore. If you if you could all do right now, can you go back a couple of slides? One, there we go. And you can find Jeff on uh, Twitter at Kane Law. Uh, his YouTube channel is youtubecom slash Law. and uh, his Facebook uh, account, which we should all go to his business page right now and like, is uh, facebookcom slash Law Office. So I'm out of here, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Kane. Thank you. I just want to start off and see, can you hear me back there without this thing? Catherine, can you hear me back there? Yeah, good. Because I have a really, 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 make this away, bad case of ADWT. And for those of you who aren't medical, attention deficit, what's that? Um, so I need to stay up. Uh, I, I have these to keep me a little bit focused uh, and on stream and just carrying that is just not going to be good. Social media law, and I guess I should just start. Um, lawyer caveat, first thing lawyers always have to do. The information you're about to hear is for information purposes and shouldn't be considered legal advice, blah, blah, blah. And the reason why um, that we can give you information, but every single situation is always different. Everything that, I mean, that's the whole point of the law. And when you do uh, go through cases in the law, and I've been teaching um, this last semester uh, real estate law at the University of Calgary Law School, is the court saying, well, yes, this is the rule, but it's going to depend on the situation. Everything depends on the situation. So if you ever have questions, call. Um, I have no issue taking phone calls all the time. Contact information is there. Um, and I, I enjoy what I do every day. I don't have an issue with it. If there's something that we're going to have to charge you for, I'll say, look, this goes beyond the scope of being able to help you out for a quick question. Um, we'll have to sit down. This is how uh, it, it will go for us. Um, as a firm, um, 
we are full service. We do everything in terms of, uh, we don't do criminal law. Uh, my practice is all happy law, uh, as I like to call it. I, I don't do divorce work. We have other lawyers who, who do that. Um, and, and I truly do enjoy what I do every day. Uh, social media. I, I like it. It's fun. It's different. It is um, something that most lawyers don't do, and I think a lot of people don't get, and obviously you do, and that's why you're here. Um, we're all over the place. And the, the downside, the only downside really to social media, years ago I had a stalker. And the stalker was kind of fun because outside her office, she'd sit there with her hood on and just wait quietly until I left the boardroom here, you know, and I thought, oh, this is really awkward. Social media, the downside is, you can be in a co-op a couple weeks ago, at paying for gas, and a guy comes up to you, are you Jeff Kahane? And I said, yes, with that little, louder? Oh. Uh, yes, I'm Jeff Kahane. And he says, I watch your YouTube videos. I said, well, are you in the industry? Like, why are you watching them for? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I just came across it, and I just really enjoy um, learning something new in a minute, minute and a half, and they're outgoing. And for those of you who haven't seen our videos, um, has anyone seen Bill Nye, the science guy? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to get a professional law version of Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, I think I could probably do better, but I don't want to spend $1,000 a video to get all the fun stuff added in, so we just have a little bit. But, um, yeah, so do you, this fellow, do you think we can go for coffee? It, no. <laughs> no, but thank you and enjoy the rest of your gas pumping. But, um, um, social media is big. And when I was asked to speak about social media and the law, it's kind of like saying, can you tell me a little bit what's on Wikipedia? There, the, the law touches everything that we do. And um, in terms of social media, there is a number of areas where uh, the law comes into play. And I'll touch on some of them, um, but I'm going to focus on one in particular that probably comes up most often for people, but it certainly is everywhere. And just with respect to law, there's always different kinds of law. So there's the real law, stuff like cases and, and rules that the government makes. And then there's TV law which is entirely different that people watch on TV. And then there's my friend said law, which is often not very good legal advice. And so we're trying to spell uh, myths, and I'll go through some of them that, that tie into social media as I go along. The first thing that is um, relevant with social media, the internet is a very, very big place, and the law tends to be a very, very small place. So lawyers in Calgary practice law in Calgary. I used to do international law, and I, mean, I was literally in eight or 10 different countries in six months. And it, it's a very different way of doing the law, but the law in terms of each country is very specific to that country. Social media, where does it exist? How does it tie into to a local jurisdiction? And, that, and not this could be a whole two hour seminar at a university level, but basically we have to look at Who's watching it? Where is it being stored on servers? Where is it being received or distributed? So there's all kinds of issues there. And just one thing I want you to think about, because it's not as cut and dry as um, I sign a contract to buy a house in Calgary, I sign it in Calgary, everyone's in Calgary. It's very different um, when we're dealing with the digital world. Where do we go? Social media and the law. How are we going to um, tie in? So, Social media issues that I'm not going to talk about, um, but just want to make you aware of. Defamation. So who's saying what on their blogs? Who is doing what on their blogs? Certainly there are people who have been sued for saying nasty things that are untrue, and that's a really key one, about somebody else. There is a case in Calgary where a fellow was called a snake, a scoundrel, a liar, a cheat um, by the media. He sued the media. The media won because the judge said, you are a snake, a scoundrel, a cheat, and, and, and the guy was. He was totally taking advantage of people who shouldn't have been taken advantage of, um, and at the time, it was the largest cost awarded against someone in Alberta's history. Um, so defamation, be careful what you post out there. Um, um, trade libel. So when you say something bad about another business and you post it out there, 
the company, so it's not just an individual, the company can come after you. And generally speaking, companies have a lot more resources to go after people. And the courts are upholding these. They're um, uh, and, and not only upholding them, but you have groups in recent cases where Google gets approached to find out you know, who was the person behind this artificial um, page. Facebook, same thing. Who was behind this fake uh, Facebook account? Tie it back to the um, uh, local service provider, so the, the uh, internet service provider for the person. Approach the service provider. The service provider tried fighting it. Uh, I think this one was Facebook. Facebook said, we're not taking a position. If there's an order that says we have to give it up, like we're going to give up the information, the service provider fought it and, and lost. The court said, we need to know who is behind what was going on. And it can be anything, and, and the court's going to look at the consequences. If we're going to invade someone's privacy, what has to happen? Um, in this case, it was a cyber bullying, and um, it was a child being uh, targeted by, by peers, and um, rightfully so, that shouldn't happen. Um, misuse of confidential information, another area that social media ends up coming in because people post confidential information that they shouldn't be posting out there in the, the World Wide Web, and once it's there, it's there forever, which could be a, a huge problem. And I'm going to briefly talk about trade secrets. This is something that could cost the company literally billions of dollars. Billions, and not just a little bit billions of dollars in a theoretical kind of way, but real uh, billions of dollars in a very real way. Um, personality rights. So someone uses your image, they put it online, you're a celebrity. You're not a celebrity. And whoever you are and associates your image with uh, a product or service, you can't do that unless you have them uh, signing on. Moral rights is another thing. They, they, there is a lot, a lot. File sharing. So, I mean, Napster was the first one where we started off. Uh, LimeWire, Pirate Bay, big lawsuits. Uh, YouTube, continually there, there's issues with things. Um, in Canada, uh, there was, um, what is it, uh, BMG Canada. I think they're a music distribu distributor group. Um, uh, keeps being things. And what I like about social media, and what I like about media in general and the law, is it's fun. Survivor. Who's watched Survivor? Yeah, he doesn't put their hand up. Hey, you know, when I came in here, uh, I, I do a lot of public speaking and I love it. Love it. And there's always a feel to a room. And this room, I came in, you guys are so like, animated and it's good. I thought, this is going to be a good crowd. I like that. Um, but come on. Who's watched Survivor? Okay. So Survivor sues another um, production company who comes up with Celebrity, which is Survivor but with a little extra twist on it. And you know, th they ended up uh, losing Survivor mm -hmm. Lost. But it's, um, um, it, it's interesting stuff. This is not, if you go to a courtroom and you watch a trial, and anyone can go into the courtroom, you can go down to Calgary and watch a trial, they are usually really, really boring. This is not like TV law that's kind of interesting and dramatic and this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen. No, it's very slow. It is not exciting, with one exception. If you are ever bored, and you are downtown, and you want one hell of a hoot, go watch Provincial Family Court. This is Jerry Springer <laughs> in real life. And, and I don't know how the judges do it. I mean, they're screaming, there's yelling, there's all kinds of things. Uh, a, a great way of doing it. Uh, one last thing I want to just talk about social media, privacy of, of, of employees. This one is becoming bigger and bigger. Um, if you have employees, we have, um, there's a number of cases now where employers are saying to their employees who they're interviewing, so to be employees, we need your social media login information and passwords. So it's one thing to go and um, look up someone's information, that's okay, but they're actually asking for it and the courts are saying, no, you cannot ask for this information, so don't even try it, no, not worth doing. Um, um, in terms of uh, employee privacy and what you have to know, I mean, the courts are gonna look at how important is it for what you're doing, are there other ways that are less intrusive on employees' privacy uh, to get information, uh, how much, you know, what's the balance between what you get out of it versus the, the, the cost of uh, disruption of privacy. So look at those kind of things. 
Um, and of course, everyone should have a social media policy at their place of employment. Um, are many people here self-employed? Yeah, yeah. So, if you're self-employed and you have employees, you should set down the rules for your, your employees in terms of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable for their social media use at work and otherwise. So, what can they post? Uh, what can't they post? Um, you should kind of see who it applies to, uh, guidelines of what's responsible, ethics, what you can't talk about, what you can't do, uh, trademark protection. There, there are a number of cases where we have employees of a company and they range from a, the good thing about having students who work for you is they like, are so eager to give you cases. Um, I hate cases. I mean, it's, in, in what I do day to day, we don't really need to use them that often. Um, Mazda, uh, um, unions, um, uh, Walmart. So you have employees who are not happy with their employer, who post things that are not happy for uh, the, the employer. And we've got employers terminating people. Look, if you were upset about this, we're firing you. There was a lady who went to their um, um, EAP, their Employee Assistance Plan psychologist, and the psychologist said, you know, it's important for you to journal. It's important for you as part of your therapy to get better and healthier is to write down how you're feeling. And so she did, in a blog. Um, and she wasn't happy with parts of what was going on at her work. And the company saw it and fired her. And that was the only one. Usually the court's saying, you know what, your employee does that, terminate. And this one, they, she actually appealed it, because she lost, the trial judge said no. She appealed it and they kind of they reduced it. I mean, she still uh, was in trouble. I think she got a suspension instead of a termination. Um, but uh, it, it's, it, again, case by case by case. Um, why? What I wanted to, I wish I was like Penn and Teller to do those little things on it. Um, what I want to talk about mostly today involves intellectual property. And who here has a blog? Who here has had someone cut something out of your blog and paste it on their own blog? Who has ever done that to somebody else's blog? Or used a photo from somewhere? Or borrowed this from there? Or sound <coughs> clips? Um, intellectual property is not smart property. It's not like these new uh, tablets that we have out there. Intellectual property is property that's developed through the creativity um, of the human thought process, of uh, human intellect. It is ideas put to paper. It is paintings, music, film, books, uh, any kind of literature, anything written down. Uh, it is um, what a person creates that has a tangible form, but is more than just this piece of paper. Well, and it is that piece of paper also. There are a number of mechanisms that we have in law to protect intellectual property, and it depends on what it is that you're protecting under where it goes. Um, the main ones that, that I'll touch on, but things like copyright, everyone's heard of copyright. Trademarking, everyone's heard of trademarking. Patents, everyone's heard of patents. Patent pending, patent this, patent that. Trade secrets, those are, those are the, the main ones I'm gonna to touch on. Um, and so I'm just gonna briefly touch on the things that aren't relevant, and I'm gonna focus on trade, um, sorry, copyright, because that I think is most relevant to everyone. Um, and, and the reason I'm doing is the background is because people get confused about different types of protection and where they come in and how they tie into um, what it is that they want to protect. So first, patents. People say, patents, I want to patent this whatever. And um, patents are, are important and they're very useful, but not for a drawing, not for a piece of music, not for something like that. A patent has to be, to patent something has to be new. It has to be um, non-obvious, so not in an obvious way. It has to be, uh, have some kind of utility to it, but it's about a process or a something that does something. Um, if you patent a medicine, you have to disclose to the world, this is how you make this medicine, and then no one else can copy it for 20 years. So you have a certain amount of time. If you invent, if you're Thomas Edison and invent a light bulb, you can patent the light bulb or a new form, I mean TVs, there's lots of different kinds. Um, 
anything new, mechanical or a process for doing something, that is what patents protect, um, and they expire. Trade secrets. So I'm going to talk about, I, I like to use Coke as an example, not the kind you put in your nose, uh, the kind that you drink with bourbon. Um, Coca-Cola has been very, very good at protecting things. So instead of patent, patenting uh, the formula for Coca-Cola, which is a recipe for making something, and they could have done that, but they only would have had protection for 20 years. If you ever bought a generic drug, you've bought a drug that was patented, and the patent has expired, so another company can produce it. They haven't had to do a billion dollars of research, and really, for manufacturing drugs, it is very expensive to um, take it to market. Um, they haven't had to do that, so they can offer it at a much lower price. The company who invented it is going to charge a lot for it, but they only can charge a lot for 20 years because then there's something, um, there's competition. With a trade secret, it's different. So if you have a, a, a process or a medicine or a drink that you don't want anyone to ever be able to copy, you keep it as a secret. And a trade secret is, is, is just that, something that no one knows. This is a recipe that is locked up in a vault. There is one or two people on the planet who knows how to make it. There are sub-licensees that you know, buy the syrup, but they, they cannot know the process for creating the product. If an employee was disgruntled, and if the employee went into the Coke safe and took out the recipe and posted it on the internet, once the secret is out there, gone. No protection. You can have it for 100 years. I mean, Coke has had it for close to 100 years. Um, but that protection is based on them keeping it a secret. So how does that apply to the um, social media? Not as much. So why are you talking about it? Just because it is one of the things that come up and people get confused about uh, in terms of the difference between the two. Trademarks. Trademarks does come into social media. A little less, I think, in terms of our group uh, with respect to uh, social media, but trademark protects an image, the picture, the McDonald's sign, the Nike sign. Um, a trademark protects a slogan, just do it. Uh, I mean, everyone, um, the lowest price is a Kmart price. Like whatever slogan or logo, um, a, a picture that you have um, for a trademark, you should register a trademark. So if you have a company and you have a company name and you want to protect it, um, you, you register that trademark, and then if you register it in Canada, you are set in Canada to protect your trademark. If someone else uses it or uses something that is really similar or confusing with your trademark, you can send them a letter that says, stop, and they have to stop. And if they don't stop, you can go after them, not just for um, using it, but if they've made profits off you know, confusing their product with your logo, you can go after their, pro their profits. So it's powerful. A lot of people don't register their trademarks. It's not, um, it's not the end of the world, but the problem if you don't register a trademark is your, your protection on that trademark only extends as far as it's known in your area. So if you have a small store in Calgary um, and it was called Subway Sandwiches before there were Subway Sandwiches and you, you're running in the Calgary area that people know about your trademark, you're protected. But if someone in Ontario wants to put together a trademark um, where they, uh, sorry, wants to trademark Subway, they can still do that. They can use your, your logo, your design, your ideas outside of the jurisdiction where it's known. And the problem that Target had when they moved to Canada was that there was another small regional store that had the name Target. Um, you can't copy someone else's and then people just pay the money if they want to use it because Target's not rebranding. Like there's, and they've got the pockets to do it. Um, trademarks tie in with social media because to protect your trademark, you've got to police it. And copyright also. Police, police, police. There is a lot of value in your trademark because your trademarks associate with it. McDonald's is a very known mark. The Golden Arches, globally, are the most recognized trademark on this planet and probably in the entire planet's history. It is very, very important for McDonald's to protect that brand. If there is a hamburger shop in New Zealand or Tuk 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 or whatever that throws up a golden arch in association with a hamburger product, McDonald's is going to be on them very, very quickly and rightfully so. You have to protect it because if you don't, you lose it. 
If someone doesn't, if you don't use your trademark in a couple years, you can lose it. If it gets, you allow people to use it in the world where it just becomes associated with something not yours, you can lose your trademark. Two examples, um, Xerox had some big problems and Kleenex had some big problems. Because if someone has to blow their nose, they don't say, oh, excuse me, pass me a facial tissue, please. They say, can you pass me a Kleenex? They don't care what brand is in the box. They don't care if it's you know, Scott's or blah, blah, whatever the names are. They just want a piece of paper to blow their nose that they refer to as Kleenex. So the brand gets lost. It's not associated with a specific product or service. For years, people would say, oh, I need a Xerox of that. Or, oh, it's in the fridge. Um, fr a frigid air is a brand of refrigerator. Um, people start associating a good and service with a particular thing. I need an aspirin. There's a thousand aspirin. What is that? It's aspirin. It's acetaminophen, or whatever aspirin is. Um, is that right? Acetaminophen? Yeah. There we go. Whatever, blah, 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 acid. Thank you. Um, but people associate a product and you lose the value. You've got to police it, you've got to protect, protect it. With the web, it is so easy for product, uh, for logos and trademarks to get misused. And it is your job as, a trade, as someone who owns a trademark to protect it. And you've got to do everything you can. There are law firms whose sole business is to protect the logos and, uh, and the trademarks um, and so it's, trademark is either the word mark, so the expression, or the image, the, the picture of something. Um, and that's all the law firm does. They look at applications around the world for people who are applying for a trademark on something, and they want to make sure that it's not similar to their mark uh, in any jurisdiction, especially global companies. I used to work for Canadian Pacific, and we had, um, this is before they disbanded, so we had our parent company I worked for, that owned CP Ship, CP Rail, CP Hotels, uh, Penn Canadian, uh, Ford and Coal. And we had a law firm that that was their job. We had a, there's a company that created pancanadian.com. Web domains are a huge problem for trademark infringements. Um, and you can get orders having people remove them or, or pass them back to you if it is your trademark and it is um, uh, associated with your mark. Um, but it's a court application, but you have to do it. These people, and years ago, and I think they probably still do it, um, there are companies and groups, and they're um, out of Asia, out of uh, United Arab Emirates, out of um, um, a number of countries, were notorious for it, where they do like the cyber squatting or cyber, where they just hoard a bunch of uh, domain names, and then if a company wanted it, they say, well, pay us. So as Pan Canadian, we had pancanadian.ca, we wanted pancanadian.com. There is no Pan Canadian, other Pan Canadian company out there, but they wanted, I think it was ten or twenty thousand dollars for us to get the pancanadian.com. They try arguing, well, you know, we have a news feed on it. I mean what these guys do is they save the name and then they load on a um, a stock. Uh, web page that is either a search engine or by herbal whatever or the weather um, say oh well we're using it, it's us and then you negotiate you got to really really protect uh, that image uh, and, and your mark you have to keep using it. I talked about it. I'm just gonna talk about this real brief you got to keep using your mark if you stop after two years you can lose it someone can apply take it off CP ships ran into this problem CP ships huge cargo container ships that travel the world problem is not a single damn one of them was owned by CP Ships because it doesn't make sense to hold a ship in Canada. They're all held by offshore number companies in weird, you know, Bermuda or, you know, all, they're all offshore. So um, someone said, well, we want to use the word CP Ships. And we had to negotiate with them because we had no, there hasn't been a CP Ship labeled CP Ships for years. The only time, and this was after this, that they had a ship that said CP Ships on it is when we wanted to get the analysts and investors to, uh, in theory, to increase their idea of, of the company. And we had a CP ship ship go past um, uh, the investors' luncheon meeting on the St. Lawrence River, which was all very nice and good, um, but it just wasn't used in connection with the, the product or service. If you have employees, you got to watch them. How do you protect your, and this is going to apply for copyright also, how do you check for these things? For copyright, you might want to take, if you're blogging, Take a sentence of your blog, put it into Google, put it in quotes, and see if someone else has copied it. 
you don't want to make it too long, but you want to make it long enough that you're going to know if someone else is using it. Um, for pictures, again, Google is a good term because most people can't afford to hire a law firm to scour the world for um, someone violating their trademark. Um, but your employees, if your employees are using it, there should always be an intellectual property policy in every company because if your employee is using it um, wrong, you can lose it. You get big companies, so uh, with real estate companies, you have a lot of realtors. Uh, Remax, Century 21, like whatever company you have, they have their image, so the hot air balloon. But the image, ha image has to be used consistently. You have to have a policy that everyone in the company, and if you license the people, because realtors are employed by, or they, they're contractors for brokerage, and the brokerage has a license to use it from um, the parent company, you have to make sure that it's used consistently in terms of color, where it's positioned, how it's positioned, so that you have a consistent image. Because if you water down an image of something, then again, you're watering down the value of your mark. And there are times where you have a company where the company itself may not have a huge value other than their trademark. Um, there, there are times where the biggest asset is that license uh, piece. And companies license just that. Disney licenses their, their characters to put on lunch kits and pajamas and all over the place. Um, every company that you see, you see Starbucks. I mean, they're providing the products too. Sometimes it's just under the manufacturing. We've got a company that's manufacturing, they just do it under license. Um, which takes me to copyright. And copyright is the, um, I think, most important for you. Copyright protects um, original ideas put down in some kind of form in terms of literature. So again, this is the books, the music, the um, paintings, uh, Anything that you create that isn't a process or idea or isn't a mark associated with a business. So it's not like a logo or brand. It is your creative juices put to a medium that other people can, can enjoy. It is not something that protects thoughts or ideas. If you keep it in your head and you leave it in your head, then it's safe because it's in your head, but you can't protect it. If you have, I have the best damn idea, but you do nothing with it, and then someone else also has the best damn idea, they can do it, and you're like, your, your position is, God damn, why didn't I do something about that? Or why didn't I do that? Um, and, and this is a business thing. Most businesses uh, succeed because someone took the time to try doing something, and most businesses fail or never get anywhere because people were scared to try to do something. Um, if you have an idea, put it down in paper. Patent the process. Patent the mechanism. Um, trademark. The idea. It's a logo thing. I think this is a, a logo that will be so good for coffee, subs, beer, whatever. Um, secure your right because the, the product is what is important once you have it protected. So copyright again. Uh, books, the stuff that you're posting online or that you're using online is stuff that's protected by trademark. How do you get trademark? We see those little C's with a circle around it all the time. Do you have to do that? Do you have to do anything? You automatically, as soon as you create something, you draw a nice well, painting, paint a nice painting. Uh, as soon as you're done doing that, you have copyright in that image. You, it is yours. You own it. It is um, for years forevermore, unless, damn lawyers and their caveats, um, you work for a company and you, in your contract with the company, have uh, said that anything that I create while I'm working here is the uh, ownership of the company, uh, then you know, they own that, whatever it is you create. The, the people who sit at Disney and draw new characters and uh, have ideas for shows and put it all down to paper, sure as anything, those people are under contract that Disney owns every one of those little things that they draw. Um, Disney, I like Disney because it's a fun company and, and people tend to know it a little bit. The Walt Disney Company, Walt Disney's very first thing that he created was owned by somebody else. He was an employee of them and he created, I forget what it was, but Disney wanted this badly. They wanted to get it back and it wasn't for sale, it wasn't for sale. There ended up being a huge, and I'm trying to remember how it was, but it, it, it involved Disney buying an entire corporate structure. I think it even involved the trade of a sporting team or something. There was, it was like one of these really weird legal things that, um, um, but they did it all just to get that very first image. And it was, I mean, it's all nostalgic, emotional. Um, that's what they wanted. There's no real value in the image other than they wanted to own it. Um, and so, um, 
you, you need to be able to um, um, do that. Don't sign any paper. If you want to keep it, don't sign anything. Keep it as your own. Do you need to put the little C? No, it's automatic. As soon as you're done doing it, there's like this little transmitter that doesn't exist, but it's, just, it's yours. You own the trademark, but how do you protect it? So if you draw something, or you come up with an idea, and you draw a cartoon character, and someone else draws, you know, coincidentally, another cartoon character, then um, you know, why should I register it? Because the first person to register that thing is going to win. And you aren't going to get into a fight about who owns that copyright in that, that image or story. In law school, in UFC Law School, we don't have a lot of the, the competition, except for one guy. There was one guy who was that guy who would hide cases in the library during assignments because he wanted to win. He was that guy who would tear pages out of books because he wanted to win. And while it's nice to have a competitive spirit, it might not be in the spirit of what things are supposed to be done in when you're with you know, 58 other people or however many were in our, our class with things. So what he did is he said to um, one of our fellow students, who was a very good student, um, there is this excellent book. It's just over in the stacks. I really suggest you get it because there's good, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And so she went, oh, thank you. I'm really appreciative. That's fantastic. And she went off to the stacks. What he did is he put his zip drive into her computer, stole her assignment that was due like in three days, whatever, took it out, left. She went back to it. I don't know what went through her head, but she did not expect him to have stolen her entire assignment. Immediately went to the professor of the class, and he says, I think someone stole my assignment. Um, so there was a hearing. And this wasn't just a hearing. This actually went to a court. They had to hire lawyers. Now, she was in a position where she could prove that um, here's my writing samples for my master's thesis. Here are my rough drafts. Here are you know X, Y, and Z. Um, and he, he just wouldn't give up. And finally, his lawyer said, you know what, like, we're not representing you. Like, it is very, very clear when she was done presenting everything that this was not his original work. He had stolen it, but she, I mean, it was a huge cost to her. It was a horrible experience for her to go through. If you want to avoid something like that, and no one's going to copyright their assignment for law school, but the principles are applied. People say, Jeff, what does it take to start a lawsuit? I said, $200, because it is. I could sue each of you for rear-ending me on McLeod Trail. Now, I wouldn't do that, and I would lose, but if you're served with something, you're forced to do it, to, to go through with things. If you have the protection of having registered your um, copyright or your trademark, uh, it goes a long way. People used to call, um, people who wrote stories would take their story and stuff in an envelope and seal the envelope and sign over top the envelope and they would post it to themselves in the mail and they'd have the stamp on it that would show the date and then they'd get in the mail and they used to call it like the, the poor man copyright because, well, sorry, the poor person copyright. Um, PC. Um, and um, so they'd be able to prove if someone else stole the, the book or the ideas that here is proof that it pre-existed anything that they did. Not the best way of doing it. It has some effectiveness. Better to, to register if you have something's original. But you can't do it. You can't do it always with um, um, everything online. You can't do it on every blog post. You can't do it on, on every, every um, time you do anything. There, there has been some changes in terms of um, the world, but, and, and the law is very slow. The law is horrifically slow at changing with changing technology because technology changes very fast. The only way the law changes is if one, um, it's legislated, so the government says, here's a new rule, or two, uh, it goes in front of the courts and the courts say, this is how this rule is going to be interpreted in light of uh, the world today. And that, that's called the common law. That's where the common law develops. Uh, a good example of that, digital signatures. Who's ever signed for anything or agreed to a contract in a, any kind of digital format? Everyone goes behind. Every time you go buy something these days, it's like that. Every time you click yes or whatever. So since the 1800s, which is a very long time ago, there have been rules about certain things that are held to be more important than other things. So real estate, wills, powers of attorney, there's like four or five things that the government back then and now have said, 
It has to be in writing. If you're selling a house, you can't have like, a great oral agreement, fine, and everything else, but for real estate, it's got to be in writing. And so, with technology, we have a lot of real estate agents who sign things digitally. And it can be digital, um, and I've seen everything. I've seen realtors take a picture of a signature and then cut and paste it into the contract. Not a good way of doing it. Signing on a tablet, um, di uh, digital signatures, type, you pick a font and type your name. I mean, the list goes on and on in terms of creative ways. And it's, it's done a lot. I'd say half of real estate agents these days, the realtors in the room, like about half, at least a lot of people are doing um, signing electronically. So where's the problem? The government came up, change, how we get change. The government came up with a piece of legislation. Legislation is called the uh, Electronic uh, Transactions Act. And it says that if something is called to be in writing, then an electronic signature is acceptable. Great, so we don't have to worry about it for real estate wills anymore. Yes, we do, because it later goes on to say that those same things that were set out in the 1800s, the government's saying is, that is still important to us today. Those are exempt from these rules. You can't do it. Um, there is one case. So where are we going to get case law that lets us interpret this and lets us start doing digital things? And I, I don't have an issue. As a person, as, as a lawyer, I don't have an issue with digital signatures uh, in theory. I don't have a concern that we can't put in mechanisms to protect you know, witnesses and things like that. But the problem is, is that the law hasn't said we're allowed to. So if someone asks for my opinion, I'll say, well, the law says you can't do that. Um, there is one court case, so again, courts that can sort of change things, that in a very specific fact situation says, okay, it's okay to do it uh, electronically by emails or whatever, but that's it. So lawyers' favorite answers when they're asked, can I do this? Probably or probably not, not absolutely. Um, would the courts decide that it would be okay? Probably in light of modern technology, but until someone actually gets sued, or until the government changes the law, we're not gonna know for sure. And I would not wanna be the person who told someone, ah, this is okay, and then for it to be pulled into the court. So technology, ever expanding, we don't know how the courts are gonna respond unless the government steps in. Tie it back to social media. The government came up with the Copyright Modernization Act. And remember, modernization sounds very good, uh, sounds very modern, um, but again, law is always a little bit behind, so even the Modernization Act doesn't take into account everything. But it, sets, it does set out some new rules in light of um, social media and the web and pre uh, uh, computers in general. Um, they set out rules that penalize people if they break electronic blocks. They set out rules that penalize people who create a mechanism to uh, break electronic blocks. Uh, and these are usually used to protect copyright, to protect um, people's, so CDs. If you have a CD that has this copyright protect that doesn't let you copy it onto your computer, if you develop a system to break that, you are now breaking the law. Uh, for years, there was a thing for DVDs. You buy your DVD, you throw it in the computer, and I, I forget what it was called, but it lets you hack away at the digital lock that protected you from being able to just burn onto your computer and then share it with everyone else. Um, those mechanisms are not legal to produce and create and sell and distribute anymore because it gives you the tool, and the only reason the tool is there is to violate copyright laws. Um, uh, they exempt internet service providers for certain things. So an internet service provider is not usually in the habit of breaking copyright laws or um, stealing people's ideas, but their subscribers often are, and they provide the mechanism that allows it. And so. It went to court all over the place, and the government said, look, they're providing a service, unless they're an active participant in this, we're not gonna go after them for these kinds of things. Uh, backup copies, everyone makes a backup copy. You are, it, it says now that you are allowed to make that digital backup copy of something that you legally obtained. So you have it for, for your use. Uh, personal use stuff has always been sort of a little different. Uh, libraries, so a library might have a manuscript, piece of paper, something that they reproduce digitally. It allows them to do that. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, it's big acts, so there's lots of different things. But the other thing that was interesting is the government stepped in and said, you know, we're going to distinguish between an individual who steals copyright and someone who does it commercially for profit. How does that work? So someone steals your favorite YouTube video that you just created and starts selling it off to people, to you know, 100 different people, it's going to be treated different than if one person steals, and we don't sell it, so it's not 
it's not uh, a good example, let's say a music video. Um, if someone starts selling copies of the music video versus one person who just takes it, downloads, downloads the movie off uh, a BitTorrent company and um, um, watches it, different. And, and a big difference. So in terms of pe uh, penalties, we're looking at a difference between one to five thousand dollars for uh, individuals to um, corporations that could be twenty thousand dollars. So and rightfully so, if someone's stealing something and commercially profiting off it. A little different than an individual who has downloaded something and um, is using it that way. How am I doing for time? Uh oh, am I over time? No, good. Okay. Um. Public domain. So copyright, people say, if I put it on the internet, I'm going to lose it. It's, you know, it becomes part of the public domain, and I lose my copyright in it. Not necessarily true. It's kind of hard to lose your copyright. You may lose the value. So if you allow someone to copy it, and you're not policing it, and your picture of something is all over the world, and then you go back you know, 10 years later and try and, well, that's mine, I want to go after it, the value of it is reduced versus if you jump on it right away where it might have more commercial value. You know, Facebook, people are concerned about Facebook all the time. And Facebook sets out the rules and the little you know, click here, I agree to the rules and terms that changes all the time, but no one reads it. I don't even have to ask the question. I can say the people who have read it have put up their hands already. Um, it just, they don't. But copyright, I mean, Facebook does say that you own your image that you put on. Now it does also give them a royalty-free, non-exclusive license to use it as much as they want until such time as you delete it, uh, and I don't remember if you have to delete your account also, um, assuming that no one else has reposted it. If it's reposted out there, Facebook's going to keep on using it. Um, and that's what their terms say. So you, you, lose, you don't lose your copyright, you still have the copyright, you still have the ownership of it, but um, it, it is out there, you don't lose it. Public domain is um, something that is out there for everyone to use without any cost. So the clip art that we used to see, it's out there, they just created it's in the public domain. People, but to do that, you'll have to say, this is a dedicated, and it's called a dedication, very creative, um, this, this is dedicated to the public domain. This is works that are out there. Other things in the public domain. So if you wrote a book 100 years ago, and you died 99 years ago, you've lost the copyright. So copyright exists and it depends, the, the rules have changed frequently, let's say between 50 and 70 years, after the time that the creator of something dies, um, uh, before copyright is lost and it becomes part of the public domain. So if you uh, write a book, you die, your estate gets to enjoy that for 50 or 70 years in terms of royalties, uh, if you're selling it, and then it's done. Uh, Albert Einstein, guy everyone's heard about, crazy hair, very distinguished image, when he died, the copyright of his image was donated to a university, so people who aren't stealing the image, and they police it because it's, it's worth millions of dollars, um, um, they, they sell it on behalf of the university. So even though it was someone else, they've assigned, they've sold the copyright in it to a university, it's part of fundraising marketing for the university. So co copyright, there is a lot of value in, in, uh, in it. Um, some things just aren't protected by copyright. There's some renewal rules, but too, too uh, um, specific for what we're going into. Uh, so some, some things are not copyright. Government documents, not anything anyone's going to be worried about here. Um, but in terms of your own copyright, you, already have, you always have it. Um, and one thing that is, does stand out, if something is in the public domain, so someone puts together if someone puts together a book or a compilation of things that are in the public domain, clip art, you know, old music, Baroque music that was, well, I don't know if they've been dead long enough, but um, old movies, and they put together a compilation, that compilation is now protected, so you can't go and start selling that compilation of things. Those CDs of old music that have been around forever and ever and ever, that are $2 at the store, they can afford to do that because they're not paying any royalties, they're old. The compilation of all those things, you can't steal the whole thing and, and sell it because the, when you put it together, it becomes a new kind of work and that is protected. Um, so you just have to be careful. So what do you have to do? Uh, and I only have about five minutes, so I'm gonna get to this part. Uh, one, monitor for abuses. You gotta make sure that you know. Listen to your friends who are telling you. Sign up for services that monitor online that if someone posts something with your name on it, you can instantly get notification that it's, it's been posted out there. Uh, collect evidence. 
Make sure that you write down um, the whens and wheres. Take screenshots, record um, anything that can give you evidence that someone has stolen your idea. Uh, identify the infringer. So this is the case where sometimes you have to go to court to be able to do that, but try and figure out, sometimes it's a company or organization, there's not a whole lot of hiding behind it, to identify who it is who's stolen your ideas. And then if you have that information, what can you do? If, if you can send them a letter, and our first step is always to send someone a letter that says, stop doing what we don't want you to do. Um, and if they stop, great. Is it worth pursuing? Litigation is horrible. I do happy law, I don't do litigation. Litigation can take years. It's emotionally draining. It's crazy expensive. So it really has to be worth it to go after it. Yes, we get people, and I used this example earlier, who say, here's $10,000. I want to fight over this $1,000 that that guy's asking for. Does that make sense? No. And usually after a couple of invoices, people change their mind. But, um, I mean, people, people do. And sometimes with copyright, if you want to protect something, you've got to work really hard to do it. Um, you got to figure out your damages. So am I actually out of pocket? Has this actually cost me something or cost my, my mark? Because if it's not, in Canada at least, punitive damages, very, very difficult to go after. There are sometimes appropriate cases. The state's very different, the law, everything in the United States in terms of litigation is very different than Canada. But in Canada, uh, um, just damages like that, punitive damages, uh, are, are much more difficult. So you have to have a tangible, uh, this costs me this, and I can record it, and that's where it comes from. Um, cease and desist orders, so the court saying they have to stop doing that, easier to do, but there's a cost associated with it. So, but if you want to maintain it, that's, that's the process you have to uh, um, do. The court, um, in terms of tracking down who it is that's doing it, if they're hiding behind a fake front. You know, they'll, they'll wonder, I like this, this quote. So, um, if something is an abusive use of the internet, now, what the heck that is, it's gonna be up to court interpretation, but, um, you know, again, you come back to like the bullying and things like that, but if you have things where um, people are, are really abusing your company and for no real purpose, um, you can't. Now, if someone posts something on the internet and says, this company is horrible because this was my experience and it is fact, you can't re-argue that. You can't argue fact. You could argue that maybe they've changed the facts or they've um, made them much worse than they are, in which case you have a, a way to go after them. But if someone says the truth, you know, it's like that guy. He's a snake, a scoundrel, a liar. It's not really a snake. He stands up on two feet. Uh, but the idea is there. I mean, he was, uh, the court said, yeah, it, it's real, no defamation on, on something. Um, and, I think I'm out of time. That's it, any questions?